I think most people have seen Flash Gordon, the very campy and colourful film from 1980. But have you read the novelisation in which a political liberal, a potential rapist and a swinger fly to the planet of the perverts? I saw the film when I was 12 in December 1980. I hadn't read the original Alex Raymond comic strips from the 1930s, but when I was a kid in the 1970s, the subsequent black and white serials with Buster Crab were very often shown on the BBC, usually in the school holidays. Looks like it's going to be a fight. The custom was in those days, if you were a geeky boy like me and you'd enjoyed a film, you would then read the novelization. In this case by Arthur Byron Cover. The book starts with a prologue on the planet Mongo, where the evil Emperor Ming and his masked henchman Clytus decide pretty much for fun that they're going to attack the earth with a form of climate change, uh, in this case hot hail. Naturally enough we then move on to chapter one. What's it going to tell us about our hero? Flash Gordon would have gladly divided the thoughts and deeds of the world into two distinct and arbitrary categories, but like many young people of his age, he Pardon me? When he had seen the newspaper photographs of a South Vietnamese officer ruthlessly executing a prisoner by shooting him in the head, Flash noted that no honorable man would commit such an act without the formalities of due process. Nor did he believe the National Guardsmen who had slaughtered the student demonstrators at Kent State to be honorable courageous men. It seems that Arthur is trying to crowbar his personal politics into a beloved franchise. We learn that Flash has had quite a tragic life, actually. His mother died three hours after giving birth to him, and his father was this horrible man, a seedy, drunken, abusive janitor who worked at a sports stadium. Now, the only good thing to come out of this is that Flash developed a love of football, or as we in the rest of the world call it, American football. Dad dies in a bar fight when Flash is 12. It's all very grubby and unpleasant. And Flash goes to live with his aunt, who doesn't live for very long either. And so he becomes this self-reliant guy who happens to be very attractive to women. But don't get me wrong, He's not in it for the physical so much as the, the spiritual side of lovemaking. And so in chapter one, Flash Gordon scores the winning touchdown at the Super Bowl and then cops off with the female journalist who's interviewing him for television. Um, and the chapter is called Flash Gordon Scores. Um, it's very subtle. The next thing we know, Flash is vacationing at a friend's isolated cabin in the woods where he's meditating. He's chopping wood and he's reading intellectual books such as the encyclopedia. He's having a meal at a nearby inn when he happens to catch sight of Dale Arden, a passing travel agent, and he instantly falls in love, love at first sight. It just so happens that they're going to be catching the same light aircraft out of town and when they're on the plane together she says my boyfriend, you see, has these needs. Needs I tried to satisfy but which I couldn't deal with indefinitely. It was just that after a while I couldn't function sexually in all those exotic bars. Around all those people doing all those strange and wonderful things with all sorts of people who were perfect strangers. The hot hail that I mentioned kills the pilot and brings the plane crashing down into the house of a former NASA scientist, Dr. Hans Zarkov. It actually crushes his assistant to death, but Zarkov isn't too bothered about that because he's too busy thinking, Hubba hubba, what a pair of gams. As the only man in the world to realize that the Earth is under attack, he's built a space rocket to take him to the hostile planet. He glanced at Dale's shapely legs, felt the pangs of passion surging in his breast, and realized that if he survived his sally and was marooned in space, he would have other, deeper needs. From this point on, the plot is largely that of the film, so I won't repeat it too much. Suffice it to say that 
Zarkov forces Flash and Dale into his spaceship at gunpoint and they fly off, they become unconscious and Dale has an erotic dream because, you know, she's a swinger. So at the sumptuous court of Emperor Ming, the trio meet fantastic aliens like the slime people and the mud men. But Dr. Zarkov is thinking like a horny teenager. He only has eyes for... The astounding array of luscious beauties with strategically exposed expanses of smooth skin in an utterly delightful gamut of shades. If you've seen the film, as I assume you have, you'll know that they also meet Prince Voltan of the Hawkmen, played by Brian Blessed, Prince Baron of the Tree Men, Timothy Dalton, and Ming's daughter, Princess Aura, played by the Italian actress Ornella Muti, who I think brought on my puberty single-handedly, if you'll pardon the expression. To be fair to Arthur Byron Cover, there is a sexual subtext to the film. Princess Aura uses her feminine wiles on pretty much every man she meets, and why wouldn't she? And Emperor Ming, for his part, uses this magic ring on his finger. Uh, in, he shines a beam at Dale Arden, and she gets all... Um, And it's explained in the book that she is thinking back to the time she was having a naked picnic one evening with an older silver-haired man. So what else is in the novel that isn't in the film? Well, it turns out that the Hawkmen are actual birds. They're not just Englishmen with wings. There's a whole scene where Prince Vulton is doing his mating rituals. Uh, you know, they lay eggs and everything. And when Princess Aura is captured and tortured by Clytus for helping Flash Gordon, he threatens her with the dreaded boar worms. And she says, no, not the boar worms. What? No, not the mind probe. What actually are the boar worms? You may well ask. Well, the book has the answer. I admit their method of entry is a trifle messy, not to mention undignified. But those who have endured boar worms have said the pain caused when they begin devouring the colon is among the most excruciating in the cosmos. From what I've been able to ascertain of your likes and dislikes down the years, I should think you'd be looking forward to this. Joking aside, this is actually a good book. It's well written for all its quirks. And I don't know why it's so hard to get hold of. There isn't an ebook version of it, as far as I can tell. There isn't an audio book. And it seems to me that the rights holders are just leaving money on the table because there's a nostalgia market for this stuff. I'd love to know what you think, and maybe you have other things you'd like me to comment on. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. Till the next time, bye.